We're not going to have time to go through all the homework today, but we will have time to go through a lot of it. OK, this is review, so some of it will be old and boring, but some of it will be new to some of you. OK, and here is a PDF. All right, so we're starting off with a general review, a general review of, um, let me make sure everything's OK here. Yes, I appear to not be muted. OK, um, we're going to start off with a general review of functions because functions are arguably the most important thing taught in, in uh, college algebra in the last 100 years, OK? The first thing we're going to do is talk about how you determine whether graphs are functions or not functions. And I hope you remember the vertical line test, but if you don't, we're going to do it right now. And I expect a cat to jump into my lap at any moment. Yes, and this will probably be George. No, George is going to the other room right now. I have two cats. Usually one ends up jumping in my lap because they're jealous that I'm talking to you rather than talking to them. Cats are like that. OK, but the vertical line test. I am going to draw vertical lines through a couple of different places on this graph. I'm going to attempt to make vertical lines. Here's George. Here's George right there. OK, George. If I let him sit in my lap, he makes less trouble. He knows how to blackmail me. All right, George, you're part of the class. Yes, you are. Come on in. There you go. OK. Um, the meaning of the vertical line test is this. If you can draw a vertical line through every part of the graph and that each vertical line intersects the graph at only one point, then the answer is yes. This is a function, and notice I do have the answers here. Whoop. Yes, I did. OK. I have to switch back and forth between the pin and the line. There you go. There's a yes, because this graph passes the vertical line test. The vertical line touches the graph at only one point. That is called the vertical line test. And what we're testing for, let me write it first. What we're testing for is whether or not a graph is a function. So this graph passed the vertical line test on the other hand, this graph will not, and I'll explain why. I am going to draw a vertical line through this graph. And notice that the vertical line intersects this graph at more than one point. Intersects the graph here and here. So that means this is not a function. No, it flunks the vertical line test. Well, there must be a more important reason here you've got vertical lines touching the graph at only one point, no matter where you draw it. And here you've got a vertical line touching the graph at two points. Now notice if all I had done was draw the vertical line there, I could say, well, gosh, golly darn, or something to that effect. 
This line touches the graph at only one point. But see, I have to be able to graph it at other points, kind of use my imagination to draw a vertical line through a graph and see whether there's any point on the graph where that vertical line will intersect the graph at more than one point. Well, why is that? Let's talk about it. This is negative one, negative two right here. This is negative two on the X axis. Negative two is being paired up with what looks like it could be one, two, three, let's say 3.6. Looks like it's a little farther up than three and a half. So if negative two is being paired with 3.6 there, that makes this point negative two, 3.6. So now I can safely say that two is being paired with 3.6. Negative two is being paired with 3.6. Aha, but Negative two is also being paired with, maybe I should have said 3.5, but let's keep it up. I'm going to say negative 3.6. Negative two is also being paired with negative 3.6. This is a problem. Because in real life, the only reason you draw a graph or you look at a graph is because it represents something in real life that's important to you. You're in a business. You're in the sciences. Something is important enough for you to spend your time looking at a graph. You need to have one answer. Is negative two being paired with, oops, that's positive 3.6. Get my trusty there. Positive 3.6, oh, that was a dashed line, okay. My attempt to draw a dashed line. I think I will draw a solid line. That will make it easier. Okay. I need to know whether negative two on the x-axis and whatever it represents to me is being paired with one number, not two. That's why the vertical line test works. Up here, I can say, well, let's stick with negative two. I can say that negative two on the x-axis is being paired with what looks like it could be three on the y-axis, and no other number, okay? On the graph, the graph at negative two on the x-axis is being paired with positive three on the y-axis and no other points. So I have a definite answer, which is why we prefer functions to something that gives fuzzy answers. I mean, what if this were New York City? And this were Los Angeles. And negative two was the point was a plane, an airplane. Whoops. Let's see. There's the tail. There's the wing. Um Am I going to New York City or am I going to Los Angeles? I mean, really, is this plane going to split in half and go to both cities at the same time? That's what this graph says. Which is why, I mean, there are some people who work with equations, graphs that aren't functions, but they're of no use to me, not if you need a definite answer. That's why the vertical line test is so important, and that's what it represents.
And so, yeah, we could go through these. Draw a vertical line here or anywhere other than that sharp point. And you see this vertical line, oops, vertical line, cuts through the graph at two points, so not a function. Yeah, right, not a function. Whereas this complicated graph, I, every time I see it, I want to say it's not a function, but it is. Because everywhere you draw a vertical line, the graph is intersected at only one point. So it is a function, even though it looks like it wouldn't be. Okay, questions about this before I move on. You studied this back in beginning algebra when you were first introduced. Beginning algebra and algebra one are the same class. It just depends on where you go to school. Okay, you also were introduced to something else, but we're going to raise it to a science now. It becomes official in college algebra. H of X, right here, we're dealing with the function H of X equals 2X. Well, up till now, most of the time, you may have called this Y equals 2X. That's not scary. You're used to that by now. But now that we're dealing so heavily with functions, we're going to get official. And the fact is that y is most often written as f of x or h of x or u of x or v of x or z of x. That's function notation for y. All it means is y. But in particular, what this really means is what does the function h, a function is just like a formula. Think formula when you see function. What does the function function What does the function um, H equal for each particular X on the X axis, for each particular number on the X axis? For each particular number on the x-axis. So rather than make an x and a y chart, um, what you do is you write the following, but first, let me go over here. If you were back in beginning algebra, then what you would do is you would write this. You would make an X and a Y chart. Remember those? An X and a Y chart. I can't draw a straight line if my life depends on it. Notice that this number negative four is in the parentheses. That means it's the X coordinate. 17 
is the X coordinate. 29 is the X coordinate. And then since Y equals to X, what you would do is this, you would say, well, that would be two times negative four equals negative eight. You would use the X for that X right there. Two times negative four would be negative eight. Two times 17 is 34. Two times 29 See, if you're doing this by hand, you would say two times nine is 18, carry the one, two times two is four, plus one is five, and that would be 58. Of course, you can always use your calculator here. I don't have a problem with it. Well, now we write it differently. Instead of making an X and a Y chart, we write this, but it says exactly the same thing. What is y when x equals negative 4, 17, and 29? And so, the way we write it now is like this. Negative 8. h of negative 4 is negative 8. h of 17 is 34 h of 29 is 58. And so it's like making an X and a Y chart. It's exactly the same thing. Let's do it again. Here we have the function K of X equals 8X plus four. That's really just a fancy way of saying y equals 8x plus 4. Okay, let's look at how they got their answers. Um, I'm going to come over here and do it. Let me erase that. Okay, if I have k of x, which is really just y, k of x equals 8x plus four. Okay, now k of 52 equals eight times 52. Notice it goes where the x is, plus four. And k of, <clears throat> it's not 52, that's the answer. All right. But if 52 had been in the parentheses, that's what we'd have. No, I have to look here. K of six. Equals eight times six plus four. That means I've got 48 plus four, which is 52. Yes, another, this is coffee, another hit of coffee. <clears throat> okay, K of negative one. Equals eight times negative one plus four, which is go uh, going to be negative eight plus four, which is negative four. Now they're nasty and they give us a decimal. I don't like people who do things like that. Of course, I chose the problem. Eight times 6.8 plus four. Time to pull out the calculator. This is the recommended calculator right here. A hard version of it. 
However, this calculator is wonderful and you can download it to your computers and I don't know if you can download it to your tablets. You'll have to find out. But you get a free 90 day trial. And I've already been able to re up once. I'm hoping they'll let me re up again. This is called the TI Smart View. TI Smart View. Uh, let me write it somewhere. TI Smart View. If you go to TI Texas Instruments, their website, or if you just type in TI Smart View, into a browser, uh, go take a look. OK, um, you'll see it's very easy to download, very easy to install. At least I had no problems with it. But I have a PC. I don't know about apples. You can do the research. Anyway, where's my calculator? Here it is. There now. OK, this calculator is so great. It has parentheses. It has a negative key to make numbers negative. And of course, it has add, subtract, multiply and divide. Um, it's just terrific. I love it. OK, but stop talking and do the work, Barbara. Eight parentheses, six point eight close parentheses, plus four, enter. And I get the answer 58.4, which they get too, doggone. Okay, this is just a new way of making an X and Y table. Does exactly the same thing. Notice that this is not K times six. What would that be? This is code. Everything you do in math is a code for something else. And what this is a code for is, put six in for X and calculate the answer. And the answer is gonna be Y. So here's another little miscellaneous fact. What I've just done here is I've found points on the line y, uh, y equals 8x plus 4. This is the point 652. This is the point negative 1, negative 4. And this is the point 6.8, 58.4. And you could graph those numbers. You probably would not unless it were really important to you. Okay. Now, let's do this one too, because notice you have variables in two places. You have the X in two places. That means you're going to put these X coordinates in two places. It's also a good chance to learn how to use the calculator. We're going to have F of X equals two X squared. I'm writing big, so I'll have, I'll, I'll have room to put X in for these numbers minus 3x. All right, so f of 0 is going to be 2 times 0 squared minus 3 times 0. If you go on to calculus, you'll find out that we don't like to talk about 0 squared. It's something called an indefinite form, uh, but you still treat it like a 0. So this is going to be 2 times 0 minus 3 times 0. That gives you 0 minus 0, which is 0. Simple as that. All right, f of negative 1. 
puts a negative one in for each X. And F of two puts a two in for every X. Now you can of course do this in your head, but I just want to do this on the calculator to give you a feel for it. Okay, what I'm going to do is type this so I can see this, and then I'll make it big for you. Um, two parentheses, I better make it big now. All right, because the negative one the negative sign comes from this key down here, not the minus key up there. And then I want to square it. I want to uh, put the exponent two. Exponent two is so common, it has its own key. Right there. And then minus three parentheses negative one parentheses closed. Enter. And there you have a five. Now we're going to do the same thing with the next number, which is two. So we'll have two parentheses, two, close parentheses, squared, minus three parentheses, two. Enter. So my answer should be five and two. Let's take a look. Yay! Okay, zero, five, two. Here you go, and I'm gonna save this before something horrible can happen. Word problems. Ooh. Okay. Let's read it. And then I'll go through it and explain it. The function a of s given by a of s equals 0 0.295 times s plus 58 looks scary. Can be used to estimate the average age of employees of a company in the years 1981 to 2009. All right, all of that's important. So average age of employees, that's what we're looking for. And we're talking about the years 1981 to 2009. Now it says, let A of S be the average age of the employee. So this is going to be what A of S is. And S be the number of years since 1981. This is a very common way in the sciences and in banking to um, work with years. Who wants to put in the year 1981 into a calculator when what, what the calculator is thinking, if it could think, is that, 1000, is that 1981 is really the number 1,981 on the x-axis so the graph goes way out to 1,981. No, that doesn't work, it's ridiculous. So this is how working with time works. This is how it's written most often. Your beginning year, here the beginning year is 1981. The beginning year,
equals year zero. Year zero means in the beginning. Now, 1982 is going to be year one because it's one year after 1981. 1983 is year two because it's two years after 1981 and so on and so forth. And they try to explain this here, but like many explanations in math books, I think it's as clear as mud. Whereas I think my explanation is good. So eh, take one or the other. Now, what we're being asked is, what was the average age of employees in 2003 and in 2009? Well, that means what is A of S? What is A of S? Because that's what the average age of employees is. What was A of S in year 2003? and year 2009. Well, I have to find out what 2003 equals, okay? So, 2003 is going to be 2003 minus 1981. Oh, I have to write it correctly, don't I? 1981. And 2009. minus 1981, that's going to give us the year. So you can pull out your calculator. Two thousand three minus nineteen eighty one and two nineteen eighty one. I get twenty two and twenty eight. So what that means is for year two thousand three. A of 22, that is the average age of employees after 22 years, or 22 years after 1981, is going to be 0 0.295 times, here's the S, so 22, plus 58. And 2009 is going to give us the average age 28 years after 1981. That'll be 0 0.295 times 22 plus 58. So we pull out our trusty calculator and 0 0.295 parentheses 22 plus 58, yeah. Okay, um, there it is written all big for you so you can see it. It's 64.49, and while we're at it, let us do this again. 0 0.295 parentheses. There is a shortcut, but I'm not gonna go over it now. We'll do it later, some other day. Okay, 
So here are my two answers, 64.49, 66.26. And so I go to write those down. only to find out they give these answers. How am I supposed to know? And the answer is that in the program, My Math Lab, these are answer boxes. And these are words written in blue underneath the answer box, telling you how to give your answer. All right? So you have to read these instructions in order to get full credit. You're being told to round to the nearest whole number. OK, well, in a decimal, this is the whole number part, remember? Now, to know how to round this, I look immediately here. I don't look at the nine, I look at the four. And ask myself, is four big enough to round this four up to the next number five, so that I have 65. And the answer is no. If four was a five, if four were a five, or a six or seven or eight or nine, then yes, it would have rounded the four up to a five. But no, four will not round any number up. So I go for the number 64, and all I do is forget about the 49. And that's how they have this answer here. Same thing here, here's the whole number part. The number immediately to the right is a two. Two is too small to round a number up to the next number. So we stay with 66, and that's how they get this answer. And that's the whole story of A of S right here, number eight, which is number eight in the homework. Now down here, you do have a graph with arrows. This is the graph, incidentally, of at least a version of Y equals X to the third. Notice it goes, now, now this is asking about domain down here, but I need to go in order. It is so easy to miss, I mean, to, to not see this first question. What is F of zero? Here's what it means. The number in parentheses is the X coordinate, and I, I, I chose to include all the answers. This is the answer. This is the answer you would put in the answer box. How would you know? Well, you go to the graph where X equals zero. X equals zero right here in the middle. That's where X equals zero. And you look and see what y equals there. Well, it's on the x-axis. The graph is on the x-axis, and that's where y equals zero. You can tell. Four, three, two, one. What comes next? Zero. And then negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, and so on. So if X, for this graph, if X is zero, then Y is zero. And this is another way of saying, okay, the point zero, zero is on the graph. But this is what they're looking for right now. If the X coordinate is zero, what is the Y coordinate? Now, this says, what is the domain? We'll look at the graph. 
The graph is going to go up forever, yes, but it's also going to go forever to the right, out to positive infinity on the x-axis. The domain is always on the x-axis. And this graph, even though it goes down forever, is tilting out to the left. So it's going to go to the left forever. So it's all real numbers again. The domain, the source of all the X coordinates, is the entire X axis, which is all real numbers. Next question. Find all the values such that f of x equals 2. f of x is a code. What they are saying is y equals 2 for what x. And of course, normally you would not see this answer. Well, what do we have to do? This is y equals 2. Go to y equals 2 on the x-axis. Then go to the graph, I mean on the y-axis because it's y equals 2. f of x and y are the same thing. Go to y equals 2. Then go to the graph. Then come down. <gasps> My goodness! y equals 2 is paired with x equals 2. So the value of x is 2. And now you're being asked about the range. Oh my goodness, range is on the y-axis. Remember, I wrote it somewhere. I thought, yeah, here. Range is the set of all the Y coordinates. Well, where do the Y coordinates live? On the Y axis. So, the Y axis is just like the X axis in that it goes up to positive infinity and down to negative infinity. These numbers just keep going forever and ever. Now notice that this graph goes up forever. That's what that arrow means. It goes down forever. <clears throat> and since on the Y axis also, it only has the real numbers, the numbers in the real number system. It doesn't have any X, well, it, do, it doesn't have any unreal numbers on it. The X axis, the Y axis, they only have real numbers, numbers in the real number system. So, all real numbers, again, is the answer. Is that always true? No. No, it all depends on the graph. It all depends on the function. Now, this question is just like the other question. Except for one thing. This question right here. This is different. Up here it says, OK. What is F of 2? That means you go to 2 on the X axis. You go up to the graph. You go over to the Y axis and you land on Y equals 4. Then you're asked, what is the domain? Well, this goes to the right forever and to the left forever. That means it goes to positive infinity and negative infinity. And all of the X coordinates on this graph will come from the entire X axis. So the domain is all real numbers. But this question, 
is tricky at first. For what x values is f of x equal to 1? Well, what that means is y equals 1 for what x numbers or x values. We have to find the x values that match up with y equals 1. Well, why is that so different? You go to y equals 1 and you go to the graph. Yes, but look. Go to y equals 1, go over to the graph, go over to the graph. You've got two x values that match up with y equals 1. All right, 5 goes to 1, and 7 goes to 1. And that's how you get this answer. 5 and 7. Notice it's not a point, you don't put parentheses. They're separate numbers on the x-axis. So all you're doing is listing them with a comma in the middle. Now you're asked about the range. This is different too. You have to actually look at the graph and say, where is the graph and where is the graph not there? And the graph is not here for any value down here. The graph starts at y equals zero, at a point on the x-axis where y equals zero. In fact, it would start at the point six zero. This right there, this is the point six zero, where this is the y coordinate. Range is the y coordinates. Should have written range, range. Okay. So we're going to go from y equals zero up forever, and that's going to be the range. There are two ways to say it. This way is called set builder notation. We have five minutes, don't give up on me. The way you would be more familiar with, that's bad English, is um, set builder notate, uh, 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 interval notation. We're all more familiar with that. But you have to be able to read both. which would say, okay, the range starts at y equals zero and goes up to infinity on the y-axis. Actually, infinity is not a number, you know, but how do you say? Well, it goes forever. Up. We always start low and go up. Um, but anyway, in set builder notation, what we say is all y such that y is equal to or greater than zero with braces at the end. And we are going to talk more about uh, set builder notation and interval notation, uh, but you've seen it before. So this is a review. All right, here, 
here are some nasties and we're going to end with some nasties. OK. The most important thing about fractions. Denominators cannot equal zero. Denominator cannot equal zero. OK, well, that means X minus two cannot equal zero because that is the denominator of this fraction. Cannot equal zero. Well, you solve this just like an equation. Add two to both sides to make that negative two zero out because negative two plus two is zero, leaving you with X not equal to zero plus two, which is two. So X cannot equal two. Here's what I have to do. I have to go to the X axis And let's see, here's the number zero, here's one, here's two, here's three, here's four, negative one over here and so on, negative infinity, positive infinity. I have to take two out of the domain. It's not allowed. So I happen to have a white marker that will let me pretend that I have a hole where the number two would be. Now, our domain is going to consist of two parts, this part and this part, but not two. Two is kicked out. And that's what this says here. X, all of the X's are gonna be real numbers. All of these are real numbers. All of these are real numbers, but not two. This says X cannot equal two. Now notice up here, this is almost right, but there's no problem with X equaling zero. If X is zero, what are you going to get? You're going to get zero minus two, which is negative two. There's no problem with the denominator equaling negative two. So this is the only answer that's completely correct. And there you go. None of these is new. These are all find the domain. We'll talk more later about how you graph uh, rational functions, which is what this is called. It's a fraction function. But I am done. Okay, we are done.